the chairman of the department. I'm glad to welcome you here, uh, even on such an unpleasant day as this, although the rain has held off a little bit. Um, this is a somewhat different format uh, insofar as it's a joint presentation between myself from the theology department and my colleague, Dr. Esperanza Camara from the School of Creative Arts here at the university. We've been talking for a number of years about how to do things together in sort of art history and theology. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the first times we've been able to pull it off. Uh, and so we're, we're delighted about that and we're delighted to see all of you. I want to welcome you this afternoon to this. We're going to try and hold ourselves to an hour, uh, which for those of you who've been around, uh, at least me if not um, my colleague, will know that that uh, is more of a challenge than you might realize. Um, I will um, begin uh, and speak for about 15 minutes, defer to Esperanza, uh, and then I'll come back in uh, at the end with a couple of final thoughts to open the discussion for some conversation. So roughly 15, 20 minutes each of us and then the remaining time for discussion. Um, I'm going first only because the piece I'm covering is historically earlier. Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries um, uh, and then uh, Esperanza is going to fill in some of the uh, history from, from the second millennium, particularly around the time of the, uh, the uh, Refor Reformations uh, in Europe uh, in the 16th century. So we're basically talking this afternoon about uh, the role of art uh, and in particular about the periodic impulse that develops among all kinds of peoples uh, to destroy art. And why is that? What is it that motivates people uh, to see art as being so powerful and so dangerous that it has to be destroyed? Um, if you remember back just a couple of months ago, we were uh, seemingly inundated with reminiscences about the 50th anniversary of the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and many of the pieces I listened to and, and read about that talked about the power of images uh, in the shaping of the 1960 presidential campaign, which he won uh, by a tiny margin over Nixon. Uh, and many commentators thought that uh, if you listen to the debate on the radio, Nixon won. But if you watch the debate on TV, Nixon lost. He talked also about the power of images of the uh, funeral, uh, you know, little uh, uh, his little three-year-old son in that salute and, and the very careful crafting of the imagery of, of uh, the funeral and the crafting of the imagery afterwards of Camelot and so on. So images have a lot of power. Uh, and people sometimes find they're too powerful and we need to destroy them. And that's by no means confined either to certain Christian groups or to certain Islamic groups. It's also uh, an inclination of certain political groups at times and other social groups as well. The term we use to describe that process of, of destroying images, the common term we use in English for the last several decades is iconoclasm. But what I wanted to do this afternoon was um, talk a little bit more about some of that terminology just very briefly. And on the handout, um, I just listed some of the common terms there. Iconoclasm is the, the common term we use in English today. but uh, Leslie Brubaker, who's probably the leading scholar of iconoclasm in English today, has recently made the argument that iconoclasm is, in fact, uh, an anachronistic term. Uh, it's a neologism that was developed in the early part of the 20th century. If you went back to the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries and the Christian debates over images, nobody would have used the term iconoclasm. They wouldn't have understood what you were talking about. She makes the argument that the term was, in fact, iconomachy, or image struggles. That was much more common in Greek at the time. That term would have been understood. So I just mentioned that to you there. Um, the, the whole phenomenon of the destruction of images that we label conventionally iconoclasm, and so I'll use that terminology, um, dates to really the, the, uh, the seventh, eighth, ninth centuries in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. And here's another little bit of terminology at risk of, of being pedantic. The term that often gets used today in English, people refer to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but again, if you went back to the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries and said, are you Byzantine? Nobody would have had the slightest idea what you were talking about. Uh, the ones we label today Byzantines never used that term of themselves. They called themselves Romans. Uh, and they viewed themselves as being part of the Roman Empire, albeit the eastern half of the empire. So concentrated in and around the capital of Constantinople there, um, and centered in the basically the right-hand side of the map here, the eastern half of the empire. Uh, 
since Edward Gibbon uh, and his so-called history, uh, we have usually referred to them as Byzantines, uh, but like so much else in Gibbon's uh, work, that's a rather problematic uh, term. They called themselves Romans. They were part of the East Roman Empire. Uh, and if you know your imperial history, the empire collapses in the West at the end of the uh, fifth century, but it lasts for almost another thousand years in the East uh, until the final sacking of Constantinople uh, by the Turks in May of 1453. So just a little bit on the, um, the language and the location that we're talking about. Why did Christians in the eastern half of the empire in the seventh through ninth centuries get so exercised by images that they undertook a campaign of their destruction? What was going on? Well, a lot of historians um, going back at least 40 years to, to Peter Brown uh, have, have said that the causes are not always clear uh, and not always singular. There are, in fact, probably several causes. More recent research on uh, the causes of iconoclasm would suggest that there are probably half a dozen anyway. We have to be cautious, however, because the literature prior to and indeed including the period of the iconoclast crisis has all been destroyed. So we don't have primary sources from the so-called iconoclasts themselves. All we have is that which was written by their opponents after the fact. So we need to exercise a little bit of caution in, um, in what we read in, in some of those sources. But a couple of the major historians today, Leslie Brubaker, uh, who's an American-trained uh, historian teaching in uh, England, uh, in her recent works, which I cite in the bibliography, has argued there are a number of causes. Uh, 20 years ago, in 1994, in a book published in, in Paris, um, the historian Alain Bessinson also argued there were a number of reasons, and I just list them here. Um, the policy of the empire, particularly towards the defunct Western Empire and the Western Church. Agrarian policy. Monasteries uh, have a tendency periodically throughout history to become very rich and very powerful, uh, and that incites a lot of uh, jealousy and destruction from various political figures. Certainly if you know, for example, the English Reformation of the 16th century uh, and what Henry VIII did to the monasteries there, um, you'll, you'll find a similar analog to what was going on here. Foreign policy was probably quite significant, uh, and foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the, what we call the Far East today, um, at least relative to uh, Constantinople, foreign policy as far as the Persians were concerned, and later the Arabs. Um, a series of wars that uh, the empire had fought against the Persians, and then later against the Arabs, um, uh, evoked a certain sense of doom on the part of many Christians, combined with the rise of Islam. Many historians today downplay the uh, impact of Islam, at least directly, but I think it seems fairly clear that the fact that Islam existed at all and was on the move, expanding into Christian Syria, Christian Egypt, Christian Armenia, uh, evoked a very, very strong sense of terror uh, in a lot of Christians in the uh, in the 8th and 9th centuries. There was a sense that God may have forsaken the Christians and God may now be favoring the Arabs and the Muslims, and that was why the uh, Arabs were enjoying such great geopolitical success. So the Christians in response to that felt like, we must have upset God to lose his favor. The way to regain his favor is to destroy these so-called idols or images. That seems to have been a significant part of the um, of the uh, uh, rise of iconoclasm, the rise of the apocalyptic, as I say there. A um, couple of the other factors, too, that, that uh, Brubaker uh, highlights. The fear of acting pagan. Again, particularly in contact with the Persians, there was an imperial ritual uh, known uh, as proskonesis, which was the kind of reverence you made towards the emperor or the local potentate. If that was forbidden to Christians under the Romans, why was it now all of a sudden permitted to Christians towards images of Christ? In other words, you take a look at um, this image here. Image of proskinesis here. We've got Christ enthroned in the center, and the man on the side, this is the emperor, um, uh, Basil, I forget which, Basil the Sixth or something, I forget which one. Anyway, he's bowing down to Christ. Christ enthroned. 
This was the kind of gesture that Christians had been persecuted and killed for refusing to do centuries before. And so all of a sudden, now you're being told, this is a good gesture, you can do it, albeit to images of Christ. I think there was a kind of a lingering memory that we could have lost our lives if we'd done this a couple hundred years ago, but now the same gesture is somehow okay if it's towards an image of Christ. I'll, I'll give you a kind of a conventional example. Let's say that we decided here at the University of St. Francis, instead of beginning our classes or our meetings with a prayer, we decided we were going to sort of click our heels and stick our arm out like this. Right. Would that not evoke a certain sense of discomfort on those of you that know, you know, recent German history? Kind of sense of, well, I'd say, well, th I'm not saluting Hitler or praising Nazism by doing this. I'm just, I'm saluting St. Francis, maybe, or I'm saying hi to God. There, I think there'd be a kind of a sense of unease that that gesture is just somehow too tainted or we're too close to that history to be able to make that gesture without feeling nauseous, probably, I would hope. That, I think that was part of the psychology for early Christians. I'm going to bow down to images now, images of Christ, when I would have been executed for refusing to bow down to images of the emperor. It's a kind of a lingering sense that that just doesn't make sense. That's not something I'm very comfortable with doing. Again, we're boiling a lot of history down here very quickly uh, to, to try and understand some of what was going on, but I think that was part of it. So after a long period, over a century, uh, of sort of rise and decline in the fortunes of icons, the uh, church finally responds. We have what's called the first period of iconoclasm, which comes up until the Council of Nicaea in 787. And there'll be a second period that will occur after the council and last until 843. So during the first period, the leaders of the church gather in a, uh, a big meeting in Nicaea, which was basically a suburb of the imperial capital of Constantinople. Gather together to figure out what is it we believe about images? What can we say about images? How should we respond to those images? So they gather. In fact, we have an icon of the, the, the uh, council itself, the various bishops and leaders gathered uh, upholding the, the uh, famous Hodegitria icon of the Mother of God. Uh, as a way of, of showing the triumph of the iconophile party, those in favor of images, those who loved images. What does Nicaea say? Again, just to pull out one of the central excerpts from, from the official um, decree of Nicaea. Note here, this is a fairly conservative text. You've got one part of the church that wants no images, or at least no personal images. You could have a cross, for example, no corpus on it but no images of faces and bodies and, and others. And then others who say, no, we can have all the images we want. Well, Nicaea kind of comes a little bit down the middle, if you will, and basically gives kind of permission. I wouldn't exactly call this encouragement or a positive statement, but it gives permission. I, images are to be given due honor and reverence. Why? Not for themselves. If I bow down before or kiss, an image, it's not for the sake of the image, it's for the sake of the one on it. And that kissing or that bowing or that kneeling or that lighting a candle in front of, those gestures of honor don't stay there. They pass over to the prototype which they represent. So if I kiss an image of Christ, I'm not kissing a piece of wood with some paint on it. I'm showing my affection to Christ, the living God, who just is not here right now. By kissing or kneeling before these images, we adore Christ and the saints whose likeness they bear. So Nicaea says you can do this if you understand what you're doing. And it goes through a taxonomy of different types of, of honor you can give. It makes it very clear that worship belongs to God alone. You don't worship images. You can venerate images. You can reverence images. You can give respect to images, but you don't worship them. Because that was the charge of some of the more extreme iconoclasts, that you're actually turning these images into idols, which you're worshiping in place of worshiping God. So Nicaea says it's okay to use these images, but Nicaea basically leaves it there. It doesn't actually develop a, a theology of images. It just says their use is permissible, but we're not going to go beyond that and expand into what a, an actual theology of images would look like. That's, I think, an interesting question that I want us to come back to later on to discuss. What would a theology of images entail? And I'll have a little bit more to say about that, but 
Having touched uh, a little bit on this history of the first millennium, I'm going to turn it over to Esperanza, who's going to talk about some other aspects of iconoclasm uh, in the second millennium, um, particularly in the West. Thank you. You're welcome. So the segue is perfect because we're actually going to see some of this same sort of wording, uh, you know, about, what is it, 800 years later. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is what happens as far as iconoclasm during the Protestant Reformation. That's the next big time where iconoclasm really becomes a major and very destructive factor in the church. Um, and what I'm showing you here is actually a little picture uh, done recording the removal of images in Zurich. I also have a map, sorry, it's a little tiny, and we've come way north. So we were in Constantinople, now we're in the far north of Europe, and um, we, um, we start to see the first instances of iconoclasm right around 1522, not too long, just a few years after Luther posts his 95 Theses. And the first main instance is actually in Wittenberg. So I'm gonna talk about that first. But really for the rest of the 16th century, iconoclasm spreads tr through Europe uh, at a really quite an astonishing pace. So you've got major instances of iconoclasm in the 1520s and 30s in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, you've got destruction of images, sort of packing up of church goods in England in the 30s, 40s, and of course these continue, but that's where we start seeing them. And then one of the most startling and devastating uh, instances in the 1560s in the Netherlands, where literally for about three months, every major city and small village in the Netherlands suffers some sort of iconoclastic event. Um, so I've got actually, and what's wonderful, in fact, in contrast to the situation that Adam was dealing with when he's talking about the lack of evidence of what the iconoclasts in uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire thought in the eighth century, we have lots and lots and lots of evidence of what they thought in the 16th century. Um, thanks, of course, to the fact that we've now got the printing press, and the printing press is being used um, to disseminate these views to the populace. Lots of writings in the vernacular in the everyday tongue, so that if you were German, you could buy a little cheap sheet uh, that would explain talk about some of these things that would even illustrate why um, images were such a problem. So I've got just, I picked a few images to illustrate how images are part of the promoting of the views of one camp or the other, and I'm focusing in particular on the iconoclasts. So here's our picture. Zurich was actually an interesting case because um, in some places the removal of images is very violent. It's done without the authorities knowing about it, and it becomes sort of this mob that has to be constrained. It makes the authorities, even the Protestant authorities, very uncomfortable. In other places, it's almost civilized. Uh, for example, in Zurich, uh, we have a letter by Zwingli, who advises the count, town council, please let people know that they should come and take the pictures that they've had, uh, that they've paid for in the churches. So before we remove them officially, if it was yours and your family commissioned it, please come and get it. You can have it in your house. Don't worship it, but you can have it in your house. Individual parishes, if they bought their pictures, can decide if they keep them or not. Just don't put them on an altar. Don't put candles in front of them. Don't kneel to them. Again, all of those things that are transferred to the prototype, they're not buying that. And that's really one of the hearts of the matter. So we've got um, uh, this illustration from Zurich. We have um, a print uh, from Fox's Book of Martyrs from England, and what we have at the top is actually people marching out of a church with all of the uh, ritual objects and statues and paintings, putting them on a ship that is called the ship uh, of the Roman church. They're getting rid of it, getting it out of England. And then in the bottom half, we see the king making his proclamations to clean, cleanse the churches, uh, and then the uh, preaching of the Protestants with the focus on uh, baptism and the Last Supper. So we've got a revised version of what goes on in churches. Then during the um, iconoclastic situation in uh, the Netherlands, which starts in 1566, heavily influenced by Calvin, and we've got some more pictures of statues being pulled down, images being smashed, um, and really the idea of purifying the churches is the idea that comes up over and over again. So our first sort of culprit, our first real instigator, uh, Martin Luther was actually out of town, in hiding, 
um, in, uh, when the first instances begin in Wittenberg. And they begin because of the preachings of Andreas Karlstadt, um, who is completely against images and for very specific reasons. In fact, he writes a good bit about it, and we assume that he shared these views in his sermons. Uh, he states that the main issue that he has with images is that they are, um, he says, it's our deeds that convict us of loving images. And that's the whole issue, that the image is being treated as if it is divine. He says, images are adorned with damask and velvet. They're crowned with gold. The faithful kneel before them, light candles, make wax offerings in the forms of sick body parts as ex votos, as if such images could heal you. Gifts of gold and silver are given to images. And this, this next one is, I think, what really is troubling. Trips are made to see specific images. I think that's what makes the Protestant reformers very uncomfortable, that it's not just that the image what you do to the image is refer to the prototype, as the Council of Nicaea said, but that specific images seem somehow to have more access or more presence of the divine. I sometimes wonder, in fact, if there wasn't the pilgrimage to the specific image, if things might have looked a little bit differently. Because it was, in fact, not any image of the Virgin Mary you could you know, put flowers in front of as a gift to the Virgin, but you have to travel to go see that particular image. That one produces more miracles. I think that's what really makes them uncomfortable. Um, so just, I just picked some examples, contemporary, right now, uh, in churches. Um, in fact, this is the image on the left, your left, yes, is an icon that I've studied quite extensively in uh, Bologna. It was believed to have been made by St. Luke. That's the story with many of these famous miraculous icons. It is still the focus of attention to the people of Bologna, and it is still crowned and covered in gold. And then I, didn't, I couldn't find an image, a good image of the wax ex votos, but we've got images of tin ex votos that appear in many, many churches in front of images that are seen as especially efficacious in producing healing. And you've got these mementos, these gifts, votive gifts, thank you gifts that people give uh, for the birth of a child, the healing of a sickness, uh, and things like that. So just to uh, show you the sort of thing that Karlstadt was uh, upset about. Um, the terminology of cleansing of the temple is very prevalent. And in Wittenberg, right around the time of the Protestant, um, the initial Protestant discussions, um, we have a series of prints. And I love how images, images are powerful. There's no doubt about it. And they're using images to make their argument. So um, you have, and they're used almost as a book. On the left side, what Jesus did, cleanse the moneylenders out of the temple. On the right side, the Pope collecting the money from the indulgences. So this really clear contrast. And some of those indulgences happened when you prayed in front of certain images. So all of these factors are intimately intertwined. Um, so these are the sorts of images that are circulating to help make uh, the argument. Now, um, Martin Luther's not in town, as I said when Karlstadt and this iconoclasm occurs. The iconoclasm occurs without the authorities knowing about it. They're very upset about it. They want things controlled. Uh, they want things to be like in Zurich in those moments where you can go and take your picture and we'll get rid of the others, but there's no fuss, no muss. Everyone is behaving orderly. That wasn't always the case. Um, and uh, Luther is very upset, not only by the violence of the iconoclasm, but because he actually thinks it's downright wrong. He says, the problem is not the pictures. The problem is how people use the pictures. If you cleanse your heart, then you can have the pictures around. They're not going to hurt you. And he's very clear about that. In fact, I had, um, let me see a quote. He says um, that when they, you cast them out of your heart, you don't use them or treat them as if they are divine in any way. They can no longer harm the eye. Um, and he goes on to say that by, doing, by destroying images, those who destroy them think that they are doing good. So again, sort of pleasing God by uh, work. Just like the people who commissioned the images that thought they were doing good. So he's saying basically you're doing the same thing. You're thinking that your righteousness is somehow embedded in what you're actually doing. And you're simply just transferring from one form of good works to the other. Um, 
So he says in both cases, the problem is still what's inside the heart. Um, so he says, if you want to remove images, go ahead and remove them. Don't do it so fanatically. He basically says images are neutral. You can, in fact, here's a quote from, um, he says, you may want to have them or not. Worshiping of images is forbidden, but not making of images. For in my opinion, there is no person who would not have sufficient understanding to be able to say, the crucifix standing there is not my God, for my God is in heaven. It is only a sign. Therefore, I must admit, images are neither good nor wicked. One may have them or not. It is possible there may be people who can make good use of them. And then this is the part that I really love. The breakers of images will have to leave me to a crucifix or an image of the Virgin, provided I do not worship them, but use them for images of remembrance. So he's saying, don't take my picture away. At least leave me with my picture because I actually find it useful when I pray. It helps to remind me. Okay. And the fascinating thing is then he starts working with an artist named Lucas Cronach to develop Protestant altarpieces that he feels are acceptable and appropriate in a Protestant context. Uh, and this is an example of one that they design uh, in conversation with each other with the three main sacraments that he's acknowledging, baptism, uh, the Last Supper in the middle, and confession. He himself is seated at the table of the Last Supper. And then at the bottom, in this little part of the altarpiece called the predella, let's see if I have a, uh, you see him preaching the word of God focused on the crucifix in a relatively empty church so that in some ways this image of Christ, this crucifix, is imagined by the people who are listening to him. And that in part is one of his points. He says, when I pray, when I hear the story of the crucifixion, I make a picture in my heart. Those are the words he uses. He imagines it. So if I can imagine it in my heart, or it with the, my mind's eye, why can't I have it in front of my eyes? So again, how you use it, not whether or not the image is there. Whereas Karlstadt and others, Calvin, just like, we don't even want to go there. The risk is too great. It's, it's seen almost as a slippery line. At what point does having the image there then make the image the focus? Um, and then here's, he even goes on to say, better yet, if you put some words in the picture. So that images become about reading. You read the picture in the same way that you read the text. If it's okay to read the Bible stories, it's okay to have pictures of the Bible stories. And to make everything clear, let's put some pictures on it. There are even examples of pictures where you can barely see the picture because there are so many words. So the pre preeminence of the word and the picture is just like another version of the word. It's an illustration in some ways. John Calvin doesn't want any of it. God is invisible. God is uncircumscribable. The spirit is not containable by the body. And he goes the route, a lot like uh, Karl Stott, we just don't think you should have them in churches at all. Preferably not even st stories, not even the narratives, which are always seen as safer than the icon, the image of the individual figure. Whereas Luther says, well, those individual figures of the saints and the virgin, they're good for me. They help me remember things that existed and ways that I should behave. Uh, but Calvin is much happier with no images. He doesn't say you can't make images, but he says you should make images of visible things that you see for your enjoyment outside the context of public religious um, actions. And if you have them at home, use them like a book. You look at your picture of the Supper of Emmaus the same way that you would read your story of the Supper of Emmaus. Um, Images weren't simply destroyed, sometimes they were mutilated. So the destruction of images has this ritualistic aspect. They were mutilated, they had their heads cut off, their hands cut off, their eyes gouged out. Sometimes we have actually images where just all the eyes have been kind of scraped off. Uh, sometimes they're hung in effigy. And it's, it's shocking to us, especially for from traditions that where we grew up with sacred images to imagine a crucifix being hung. But the whole point was to say that it's just wood. As Luther said, our God is in heaven. It's not the picture. So in some ways, it was proving that the images are not powerful. These images that everyone thought were curing them, look, I can do this to them, and they do nothing because they're dumb material. 
Uh, so it's a very powerful way of saying, look, it's kind of, it's, look at what you've been believing and look at how it's not true. I can do this to these pictures, nothing happens. Um, and these are some examples that were discovered under uh, white covered walls when they were removed of the decapitated heads of some of the figures in Utrecht. Uh, and then we start, we get, especially uh, after uh, Calvin, Im more images, more paintings, of the churches being stripped clean. So what's the impact on art? I guess that's, that's where I come in. What does all of this discussion about images do to the art that gets produced? Because believe me, Holland doesn't stop making art. To the contrary. Um, so, no pictures in churches, only images of the narrative, uh, if it's going to be religious. Um, they're acceptable in private. These are sort of uh, Calvin's main points. Images that replicate things God has made are good. And the impact on artists is Artists now lose a big chunk of their market. In fact, there's this very sad letter of the artists of Strasbourg to the city magistrates. We don't have any work. No one commissions stuff from us anymore. It had a tremendous impact on art, including the development of a type of image of the clean Protestant church. It becomes a genre in Dutch art in the 17th century. Beautiful white churches with a focus on architecture, no pictures. Things that they see in nature still lives, flowers, landscapes, images that remind them that time is temporary. So lots of art, in fact, a tremendous production of art in the aftermath, just not a ton of religious art, but there is religious art. Rembrandt is a Protestant who paints beautiful narratives for the private context, never for the public context. The Council of Trent. The church is trying to respond to all of this. The church has had images for thousand, more than a thousand years. Uh, so there's the Council of Trent, literally the last session of the Council of Trent. Like, we better say something about pictures. And they do. And they repeat things that we heard from Adam about the Council of Nicaea. The images, uh, veneration of images is orthodox because the honor shown to them is referred to the prototype. They affirm the teaching role of images. So they tell the stories of the faith for those who can't read. They remind us. They inspire us. And then they remind the bishops, pay attention to what art is being put up in your churches. Make sure that it's going to lead to good thoughts. Make sure that it's theologically accurate. Uh, make sure that people aren't having big parties when they're celebrating the feast days of the saints and carrying their statues around in processions. So this attempt to temper the abuses. Maybe if we handle the abuses, it won't be such an issue. And I just wanted to give you some concrete examples of what were the issues. Um, the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel was one of the issues. Lots and lots written about it. Uh, lots of nude figures, um, lots of figures that are um, mythological, that are being mixed in with the Christian. Um, figures hugging. Why are they hugging? Why are they kissing? Anyway, there were Catholic uh, clergy who were very upset about uh, this. Um, and in fact, uh, if you take a look at the image on the right, you'll see a detail of St. Catherine with her wheel. And originally, she was nude, so the issue of nudity and potential for uh, lascivious thoughts. Uh, and on the left, you see the censored version, the version that we have now, where she has been covered up, and the gaze of St. Blaise just behind her has been shifted away from her. Otherwise, it looked like he was oogling a nude St. Catherine, not especially appropriate. Uh, so those are the sorts of things that they were wanting to clean up. We have one famous case of an artist that is brought before the Office of the Inquisition after Trent uh, because someone sees his painting and they don't get it. And there's even that little document. He really does have a conversation with the Office of the Inquisition. This scene is a Last Supper. And someone says, well, you know what? I don't think it looks like a Last Supper. How are people going to know it's a Last Supper? It doesn't look like all the other Last Suppers. It's confusing. And pictures should not confuse the faithful. Um, and here are some of the, like, who are all these extra people? You've got soldiers, you've got parrots, there's a guy with a parrot. What's going on here? Uh, and here's our nice Leonardo Last Supper, nice clear image, and then we have Veronese. Uh, and they say, how about you just, in fact, can, I don't know if you can see there's a dog in front of the table in his Last Supper. Say, so how about you just make that a Mary Magdalene? Then it becomes the supper in the house of uh, Levi, and no problem. Uh, and what he actually does is he puts the title 
uh, chapter, Luke chapter 5, where one of those other feasts is, and then it doesn't become the Last Supper anymore, then the problem goes away. But it's this idea of confusing the people. And the, his uh, transcript, it's fascinating. Why did you put all this stuff? Well, I had a lot of space to fill. I'm an artist. I have to put interesting things in that space. I have to give you interesting things to look at. Um, so it's really, it's one of these fascinating moments. Um, and then we have treatises written by bishops trying to get the artists in their diocese to do the responsible thing with art. And the main thing that I always keep in mind is they're saying, you are silent preachers. What you put on your pictures is the visual equivalent of a sermon. You're supposed to inspire people to do the right thing, to teach them about the faith. So make sure that your art is correct and inspiring and modest um, and uh, to delight, to instruct, and to persuade persuade people to behave in a way that is honorable. Uh, and here are some examples. Artists have different ways of doing that. Uh, some of it very realistic, some of it more idealized so that the Virgin Mary is modest. Uh, but just some examples that I wanted to show you um, about how artists created this art that was a visual sermon. And then also images that reinforce that these old icons are special and sent from heaven. So the cult of images is sent from heaven, is basically what these images mean. So they contain these older icons that were special icons, and they're being brought down to humanity by angels. In fact, there's an example by Rubens, and the Rubens, there's like, this is the icon that it used to be on a wall, on a wall in 15th century Florence. It got, um, it became a, fo a focus of miracle working. It got put into a church, and Rubens makes this whole altarpiece, and you can kind of pull down his version so you can see the real one on special feast days. Uh, so still with the idea that some pictures are better than others. Thank you. That was, that was fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I want to end with a question that will, I think, maybe try and tie together um, both of our presentations. So after, uh, well, in fact, before uh, Nicaea II and 787, one of the great fathers whose thought the fathers of Nicaea draw on is John of Damascus. Damascus, of course, the capital of Syria, right in the front line of the encounter between Christians and Muslims. Uh, and John has a very clear justification for images, which is it's the incarnation. God took on material form. We can venerate God. We can venerate the matter that God himself assumed. So it's, it's, a, it's an argument in favor of icons, in favor of images driven directly and, in fact, entirely by a theology of the incarnation. Final question I want to, and then I want to uh, open it up to you for some thoughts. Is there more to a theology of images than merely the incarnation? This book that was uh, recently translated into English, uh, Images or Icons in the Name of God, was written by Sergius Bulgakov, uh, who died during the Second World War. Bulgakov is widely uh, credited with being uh, the greatest Russian theologian of the 20th century. Controversial, he kind of pushed the boundaries a little bit, uh, but a very powerful mind. And in this book, he basically argues that Nicaea does not give us a theology of images. It's merely permissive. It says you can use them because they illustrate the incarnation. But that's as far as its theologizing goes. Bogakov's argument uh, is picked up in a new book. I'm only halfway through it. It's a dense book that just came out uh, late last year. Um, by Cornelia Sirkidu, who teaches at uh, La Salle University in Pennsylvania. Um, and she, makes, she takes Bogakov and then pushes it even farther. Um, and just a couple of excerpts from her book that I, I want to throw out for some of the discussion. She says, uh, and she's talking about both Catholic and Orthodox theology, images are auxiliaries to prayer and piety. Aesthetic questions are not raised, and the aesthetic identity of an image remains undefined. Thus, we do not have a theology of images. We only have theology in images, or a theology through images. And so my question to you is, is there not a, a rather glaring irony here? She goes on to say that the refusal to consider any possible worth for images as images is itself a form of iconoclasm. The image, in this case, is not shattered. It is either displaced or exploited. Keep the image intact and give the art object the reverence it deserves, 
and iconoclasm in all its varieties vanish. I honestly don't know what to think about that. And so I wanted to sort of end with that as a question to see what, uh, uh, what you might think about that. Um, because if we talk about a theology of images, rather than a theology through images, rather than just a kind of a crudely instrumentalist understanding of images, what can we say about that? So just a couple of things to, uh, to sort of provoke the discussion a little bit. You know, St. Paul in his letter to the Colossians is very clear. Christ is the image, or ikon in Greek, same word we find in Genesis and elsewhere. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And with slightly less authority, um, Hanser von Balthasar, one of the great Catholic theologians of the 20th century who died in 1988, also has this passage here in which he says, as you can read, Jesus is the image. Not merely the word, not merely the exegesis, but the image of God. Echoing, of course, St. Paul. So I thought it would be a little daring, if you will, and end with sort of a retranslation of the famous prologue of John's Gospel. If we take Paul's logic that Christ is the image, and we swap out logos in Greek for ikon, you know, word for image, what do you think of that? How does that sit? What kind of theology might follow from that if we stopped hearing Jesus as the Word of God, He is that, but if we gave the emphasis to Jesus as the image of God. In other words, if we, we, we swapped in Paul's logic to, to John's letter, would that stimulate some kind of uh, theologizing of images, not merely theology through images or theology in images, but could we come up with a theology of images? And so with that, I'm going to end. Um, I'm, and uh, open it up for comments, either on my particular question or on either of our presentations, anything that you wanted uh, to, uh, to start with. Uh, uh, and, I think and that was very much one of the arguments um, around the time of Nicaea, was that, that uh, uh, you know, we're going to undercut our understanding of Christ, depending on how we come down on this question. Uh, and are we going to undercut his humanity, or are we going to undercut his divinity, or is there, is there a way at all that by allowing images you can somehow, the divinity is unportrayable, but given, you know, given Chalcedon's declaration that Christ has the two natures without confusion, can we say that by portraying Christ in his humanity, we're also giving people an insight into his divinity? And that was, and I think that, that is a great question, and I, and I, think, I think it still sits a bit uneasily um, within the broad tradition of both East and West of, of how, how do we do that? And what does that say about our bodies and, and about Christ and his two natures? No, it's, it's a great point because in the case of what happens with the monuments men, you have some images being destroyed by the Nazis because they're seen as degenerate art, and some images being collected by the Nazis in order to be models for what art should look like, and some of those images then being protected from the Nazis, but it's the same thing. It's sort of the shift. Then it, the, the value is then cultural. Some of it has the cultural mark of having value and others don't. In fact, there's a great article about the recent iconoclasm of the Taliban in the Bamiyan Buddhas, that, uh, and it talks about how one of the issues there was not so much uh, religious necessarily as that now the West and other countries who were willing to spend millions of dollars to preserve or move those Buddhas have fetishized or idolized the object of art. And hence now we put them in sacred spaces known as museums. And it's really, I mean, it works brilliantly that there's just this shift. Now the value becomes as a cultural artifact. But still, is it valid value? Well, well I think what happens is once the image is used in an acceptable way, it's not an issue anymore. And I think also, I think it's very important to emphasize that Protestant is broad. There are many, many, inter I mean, if you walk down into any of the churches downtown, the Protestant churches, you will see a wide range of types of images or lack thereof. So I think we still, we live in the visual culture of the developments that I was talking about. A Lutheran church will have more images. An Anglican church will certainly have images. Uh, it might not have candles or a kneeler in front of it, but it will have the images. Whereas, you know, some Baptist or Mennonite churches might 
have a cross and a symbol of flame for the Holy Spirit. So I think we still, we kind of live that. It's kind of settled, yeah. I suppose. Well, one of the things I find interesting, and I, I mentioned a couple of the books in the bibliography, is um, there's been an explosion of images, uh, or expo explosion of interest in images over the last number of decades, and you get books on them being published by academic and popular presses, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant presses. Um, and you find increasingly um, actual Byzantine-style icons in a number of Protestant churches I've seen in, in Methodist churches and, and, and others. Not a lot of them. I mean, you don't have the lavish array that you find in an Orthodox church, but you might have, I mean, the, the one you fairly regularly see, or I've seen is, is of course, Rublev's Trinity, mm -hmm. probably the most famous yeah. of all yeah. icons. I've seen that in a number of Protestant churches. Uh, and I have a friend who's a, a, a Byzantine iconographer uh, in uh, Georgia, um, and he goes all across the country giving workshops on icons, and he's constantly being asked to come to various Protestant churches. Not all of them, but more the sort of, uh, you know, uh, the Methodists and the Episcopalians especially, mm -hmm. um, but some Presbyterians uh, and some of the other traditions. So there, there seems to have been a, a shift away from the, the more radical uh, uh, attitudes of the 16th century uh, on the part of some, at least here in North America. Well, because the issue was not the existence of the image. The issue was how you treat the image. I, I'm going to be speaking off the cuff here because I haven't researched this. My impression is that there will be pressure, even if it's not an always articulated pressure, about how much money you spend on the art and how your church looks in comparison, to, especially when you're, you're one among many versions of Christianity. Uh, I think the issue of spending the money is a big factor, and this was one that the Protestants talked about Luther did. If you're going to give God a gift, a gift, give it to the poor, the living image of God. So I think we have a, a number of factors, the money and the awareness of maybe the criticism of the visible ostentation as it could be seen. Adam, do you have thoughts on that one? No, it's not a, like you, I, uh, it's not an area that I know well. So, um, I mean, I think your theory makes sense that it may have been a kind of a reaction. Okay, if there's going to be nothing in, in you know, First Presbyterian Church on this corner, then, then you know, St. Sebastian's over here is just going to be jammed. I mean, I, I think there may be something to that, but, but I, then when I, the Catholic, I don't know. The Catholic Church gets built in the 60s or 70s, right, it looks right. very different. So I right. think there, I mean, there are a number of factors, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that was one. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, if you were to ask people, they would be able to articulate that it's the prototype. I'm sure they'd be able to articulate it, even if there is a particular image that helps them pray and be devout. I mean, I tested it out on my grandma. God bless her soul. She's not here anymore. When I started getting interested in all this, you know, I'm like, there's a lot of funky stuff going out there. I got a lot of images around me. And there are lots of candles, and I was very curious. And I think. And I think that would be the key. Are you able to articulate the difference, that it is really just a, a picture? That said, I think that in general, we still cringe at the idea of harming. I've got lots of little saint cards because they come in the mail, and I don't want to throw them out. I mean, it's sort of this like, reaction. But I think that's true in a broader way. Who wants to rip up a picture of grandma, right? You know, we have an aversion to, so again, maybe it is that power of the image. We have an aversion to harming something that represents something we care about. So it is the same with the picture of grandma or going to the cemeteries. They're not there, but we still feel the need to somehow go honor their memory by doing something physical. That's, I guess, my take on it. Yeah. Some of it may be curiosity, but I think in some cases it really may fuel people's faith. I mean, I suppose how I see it is whatever it takes. If that's what inspires you to pray and to get to know God and to do good, but I'm not a theologian. But that's that's how I see it. Um, well, and and sometimes there's 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 a there's a long-standing tension between sort of theology and practice. Uh, I mean, this is true in any question you want to look at, uh, you know. And the theology tends to be more restrained, uh, and the practice may be a little more extravagant. Um, and that's often a tension between sort of what church leaders try to sort of rein in a little bit and what the people are willing to do. Uh, and sometimes you find the sort of the popular piety outstrips what you're officially supposed to do or permitted to do. Um, and that, and that, you know, that, that, that crops up not just around images, but, you know, other, other areas too, that you, you have people out there, to use the old uh, hackneyed phrase, you know, trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. 
uh, and and that you know sometimes I think is is a tension that we see um, uh, both ancient and modern periods. Usually, just general statements about how mm. images that are made still now should contribute to the space of worship and help you. But that that doesn't address things like where the choir is placed. I mean, those are sort of some architectural things. But I think to this day, the the statements always remain vague. The Official statements are always yeah, vague, yeah. and there's a lot of room for interpretation, and there's a lot of room for individual communities to decide. And then there's also the, the look of Catholic art. The, I call it the kind of Catholic kitsch art, which is very prevalent, and then you have the really modern things. And I think uh, we don't have a real style. I mean, there's some evolution there. I'm not sure it has any direction right now. Uh, I think it's an interesting question, but... Yeah, and official statements on any number of issues, politics, art, other issues, official Catholic statements tend to be fairly spare and fairly conservative uh, and, and fairly broadly written. Um, you don't have a statement saying, well, we're going to ban you know, Gothic now in favor of the Baroque or something. Um, it doesn't take a stand on those kind of questions. One document that's interesting, if you haven't read it, it'd be worth going back to reread. It came out in 1999, uh, written by Pope John Paul II, titled simply Letter to Artists. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting invitation in there to sort of say, you know, we're in a different period now. Uh, are there artists out mm -hmm. there who can develop art that is good and leads to God, but also reflects the sensibility of our era? I was um, also just speaking of John Paul II, just this morning reading a passage in one of those books that you cited about how he talks about uh, the last judgment and connects it to the theology of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing because these, these images continue to have a life. I mean, still used, right? Mm. So. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this has been very enjoyable for me and I think for yeah, both of us, for all of us, I hope. So. Um, and I wish you a good afternoon.